Lord of Mysteries 2, Circle of Inevitability. Chapter 11, Madame Puolis. The azure sky was speckled with fluffy white clouds, gently blown by the spring breeze that carried with it the fragrance of the forest. White geese pecked at the lush grasses, grazing beside the meandering river. A lass, draped in a grayish-white frock, stood intently observing them with a long pole in her hand. Her countenance was bathed in the golden sun rays, exposing her thin, downy hair. The girl's brown tresses, elegantly tied in a white cloth, revealed her youthful and lively features. Glancing at Lumian sitting under a tree by the river, Ava Lizier scrunched her face slightly. Are we not here to discuss which legend is easier to investigate? Why have you turned into a stone statue reminiscent of the ones from the cathedral? Ava was the daughter of Guillaume Lizier, the shoemaker. Being one of the few youths in the village, she had an amiable relationship with Lumian and Riamund. I'm contemplating a problem, Lumian responded, still gazing at the white geese and the rippling waters. What problem? inquired Riamund Greg, who was tending to Ava's flock of geese. Lumian pondered before replying, What if you come across a beast with a thick hide that your weapon cannot pierce? What would you do? Obviously, I'd find a way to flee. The mountains are teeming with wild beasts. We need not hunt it, Ava replied, feeling that there was nothing to worry about. Lumian grunted in disagreement. What if that beast is exceptionally rare, and the lords in the city adore it, and are willing to pay a hundred louis d'or for its carcass? A hundred louis d'or, two thousand verl d'or. Riamund breathed heavily. He had never seen a louis d'or before, nor had he used one. His instinct was to convert it into verl d'or first. With such a hefty sum of money, he could start a small business in Darij. He wouldn't have to fret over shepherding anymore. He quickly thought and suggested, borrow a shotgun. The beast's skin cannot be penetrated, Lumian rejected flatly, even though she knew the prey was just a figment of imagination. With no value in the real world, she couldn't help herself. Is it a powerful creature? Fierce. Lumian paused to consider her question. It's about as fierce as me. That was all the assurance he needed to continue his hunt. Riamund, who had been holding his breath, let out a sigh of relief. Good. Go back to the village and round up some people. We'll surround the beast and drain its strength. Once it's down, we'll tie it up. He knew that Lumian could fight, but that was all. In that case, we can only expect to get ten louis d'or, or even less, Lumian reminded. Ava, with her stunning lake blue eyes, had an idea. I've seen them hunt before. Maybe we can dig a trap and make it fall. That way, we won't have to worry about it getting back up. Lumian nodded his approval. That's a good idea. Realizing that Ava and Riamund had little to offer in terms of planning, Lumian took control of the conversation. Which legend do you think we should target next? He asked. Ava shook her head. Neither of them fit the bill. They're either centuries old or were only seen by one person, who is long dead. Riamund agreed. That's right. If you don't ask the right folks, how would you know there ain't no clues? Lumian clicked his tongue and chuckled. You lot don't have any grit. If you want to give up at the first sign of trouble, you might as well be tending geese and sheep for the rest of your days. Ava and Riamund were fuming at Lumian's words. When it came to riling people up, Lumian was one of the best in all of Kordu. Ava blurted out, I don't think any of them are suitable cause there are more suitable ones. What is it? Lumian's eyes sparked with interest. As soon as Ava spoke, she regretted it, but she'd been planning to bring up this issue. She just didn't want to reveal it to Lumian and Riamun so easily. After a few seconds of tense silence, she glared at Lumian. There's a real witch in the village. Who is it? Lumian's heart tightened. Could it be Auror? If Ava found out that Auror was a warlock, he and Auror would have to flee Kordu and go somewhere else to avoid the Inquisition's wrath. Ava looked around nervously and lowered her voice. Madame Puolis. Madame Puolis, the administrator's wife and the Padre's mistress. Lumian found it hard to believe. Are you serious? If Puolis was indeed a witch, how could Lumian have missed it when he found out about the lady's affair with the Padre? No way. Riamund was exceptionally surprised. Ava tiptoed and looked in the direction of the village entrance. I'm not certain, but Charlie, the administrator's valet, let it slip once. He told me that Madame Puolis is a soul messenger who can talk to the dead and help them return home. He also said that she can create secret medicines and charms. Lumian listened intently but remained skeptical. With magazines like Psychic, Lotus, and Hidden Veil flooding the market, it wasn't uncommon for the administrator's wife to be familiar with such terms and trick the servants and villagers. We should go to the cathedral and snitch, said Riamund, his eyes wide with excitement. 
Lumian paused before responding. If Charlie knows that Madame Puales is a witch, then the administrator should know as well, right? We agreed Ava. Lumian continued, Madame Puales is also the Padre's mistress. If we go to the cathedral and snitch on her, we will probably be sent straight to the administrator. What? Madame Puales is the Padre's mistress. Ava and Riamund were shocked. I saw it with my own eyes. Lumian chuckled. Pretend you don't know. Don't tell anyone. Otherwise, you might disappear one day. Ava and Riamund agreed in unison, their expressions unusually solemn, their fear of the Padre, and the witch intertwined. If we can confirm that Madame Puales is a witch, we'll go to Darij and tell the bishop at mass, Lumian assured them. We, Riamund nodded fervently. They had to be sure before they snitched. Otherwise, they would be in trouble if Madame Puales was innocent. After discussing these matters, Lumian, who didn't want to waste any time, stood up and said to Ava and Riamund, I'm off, back to my studies. Otherwise, Aura would be chasing me with a wooden stick. You two take care of the geese. Okay. Riemund was thrilled at the prospect of being left alone with Ava. Ava looked displeased. As Lumian approached Kordu, he began to hide his tracks, constantly paying attention to whether there was anyone nearby. He had to be careful, especially now that the Padre and his crew were on his tail. According to his observations, the Padre, Guillaume Bennett, was not one to forgive easily. He made his way towards all tavern, trying to stay as inconspicuous as possible. Suddenly, he heard the sound of bells ringing in the distance. Lumian turned to see Ryan, Lee, and Valentine approaching Naroka and the others. The bells on Lee's veil and boots rang clearly and melodiously. They've been wandering around the village for the past two days, chatting with people and asking questions. I don't know what they are up to. Lumian was puzzled and a little wary, as he thought about the deserted town square and the shepherd, Pierre Barry who had returned to the village unexpectedly. Lumian knew that something was about to go down. Is something about to happen in the village? He needed to speak to Aurora, his smart and knowledgeable sister, and get her opinion. Lumian managed to sneak into all tavern and spotted the woman who had given him the tarot card sitting in her usual spot, eating. Lumian leaned over and took a glance. Omelette au lard. Don't you find it a little too cloying? In Darij, this dish was the go-to for ordinary folks to impress their fancy guests. Lumian, however, had his doubts about it being too greasy and heavy for city women. The lady savored a slow bite of the golden omelet and shut her eyes to savor it. It's a real gem. It's got this local flavor that's just exquisite. You're having lunch so early, Lumian asked, seated across from her. The lady's light blue eyes betrayed a hint of exhaustion as she smiled and replied, It's breakfast. What time is it? Lumian didn't dare let slip his thoughts. He scanned the nearly empty all tavern and hushed his voice. I saw a ruin in my dream and came across a monster. Oh, the lady didn't bat an eye. Her expression even held a hint of teasing mischief that Lumian couldn't quite decipher. Lumian composed himself and recounted his tale. How do I vanquish this monster? The lady beamed and countered, is it dead or alive? It's still kicking. I can't seem to kill it. Lumian trailed off then answered on reflex. He pondered in earnest for a beat before replying slowly, I can feel it breathing. So, it's gotta be alive. If it's still breathing, then try harder. Lop off its head, or pour oil and light it up. Bury it alive, even. Who knows, it might just kick the bucket, the lady suggested nonchalantly while relishing her meal. When you've exhausted all options and still come up short, then come to me. But I'm not your nanny who'll coddle you through every little problem. If you want to learn, you've got to figure it out on your own. She's quite the charmer. Lumian wasn't crestfallen or dispirited. It seemed the lady was hinting that she'd lend a hand if things got truly dire. And a monster like this wasn't even worth mentioning. But what's trivial can be a real headache. Lumian felt a migraine coming on. He resolved to heed the lady's advice. He'd start by trying to behead it, burn it, bury it alive, and anything else he could think of. Chapter 12, Undercurrents As Lumian left all tavern, he resumed his surreptitious ways, skulking down the path he always took home. Sure enough, he spotted one of Pons Bennett's goons hiding behind a tree, spying on passersby. The Padre doesn't know when to quit, Lumian muttered to himself. But Lumian couldn't retaliate. His personal abilities were limited, and he couldn't risk bringing attention from the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun in the Darij region. The Inquisition would be all over him in a heartbeat, which could spell doom for Auror. Unless Lumian was pushed to the brink and had no other choice but to abandon the town, his only option was to expose the Padre's unsavory activities and force him to retire to a cloister. But that was easier said than done. Lumian needed to be careful and cunning, just like when he let the foreigners discover the Padre's affair with Madame Puales. Lumian didn't want to make a big fuss about it. He knew that Beost, the administrator and territorial judge, was a stickler for his reputation. 
if Lumian brought Madame Pualis's predicament to light, he wouldn't get any favors in return. No, it would be more likely that Beost would turn on him, filled with bile and vitriol. That would leave Lumian with little choice but to flee Cordu, with both the Padre and Administrator hot on his heels. He proceeded with caution, taking a detour through a narrow alley that weaved between several houses. Along the way, Lumian relied on his wits and the surroundings to conceal himself. He ducked behind walls, slipped through doors, and took refuge behind trees whenever necessary. As he neared the end of the alley, he heard the sound of voices. Guillaume, why we waste our time chasing Zatkeed all day? Let's go to Auror's house tonight and catch him. We always the advantage of numbers, and Auror's fighting skills ain't enough to stop us. We can even get reinforcements from Z City if needed. Guillaume, the Padre is here too. Lumian stopped, retreating into the corner to eavesdrop on their conversation to see what plans the Padre had for him. Guillaume Bennett's voice was mesmerizing. Surely, you don't think that's the extent of Aurora's capabilities. I wouldn't be surprised if she had supernatural abilities beyond mine. Ah, uh, Pons Bennett was obviously surprised. A witch, you say? Guillaume, maybe it's time for you to venture to Darage and seek out Z Inquisition. If you can catch a true witch, Z Church will undoubtedly grant you a great reward. And with that, you may finally attain the extraordinary strength you've been yearning for all these years. Imbecile, Guillaume Bennett scolded his brother. Don't you know what's happening in this village? The Inquisition has noses like hounds. They won't overlook any anomalies. When the time comes, we'll be in hot water. Even if Aurora desires to deal with us, I have other solutions, he said. We mustn't arouse the Inquisition's attention. So, what is happening in the village now? Lumian took this seriously and was curious. Combining his observations of abnormalities, he sensed that something terrible was brewing and developing in the village, like a turbulent undercurrent under the calm sea. To Lumian's dismay, Pons Bennett didn't elaborate on the topic. Instead, he focused on something else. Do you have any way to deal with a witch? You don't need to know, the Padre, Guillaume Bennett, responded in a hushed tone. Next, we can put aside dealing with Lumian, but we still have to maintain appearances. We can't let anyone suspect my desire for revenge. That will provide the connections the foreigners need and have a negative impact. What you need to do now is to remind each relevant person and scare those yokels who might notice. Don't let them spill the beans in front of those foreigners. Guillaume, you mean that those foreigners are heir to investigate that matter? Pons Bennett appeared fearful and concerned. Look at you. All brawn, no brains. You're nothing like your brother, a natural-born leader. Lumian mocked Pons Bennett inwardly, despite his disdain for the Padre, whom he saw as a crude and greedy stallion rather than a man of the cloth. Lumian couldn't deny that he had a certain rugged charm. His direct, domineering style and clear mind won over the masses in the countryside, making it easy for them to idolize and rely on him. Guillaume Bennett sneered. No need to worry. So long as those foreigners don't find any real evidence, I'll still be the Padre of Cordu. Pons, you need to understand that ruling through fear and intimidation won't lead to peace or prosperity. The church doesn't want a ruined town that can't pay taxes. We need friends and followers to maintain control. By offering them protection, we can gain their support. The church trusts us locals with our relatives, friends, and followers to handle matters here and doesn't bring in outsiders who could make a mess. As long as there's no solid evidence, the higher-ups will continue to believe in me. All right, I'm off to the cathedral. That does sound logical and persuasive, but your wisdom and insight are limited to Darich. Auror told me that when the church confronts villages that are overrun with evil gods, they obliterate them entirely and raise the land to the ground. They don't just slay the adults, but even the kids. Lumian found himself almost swayed by Guillaume Bennett's words. Luckily, Auror had warned him about the fearsome reputation of the Church of the Eternal Blazing Sun and the Church of the God of Steam and Machinery. After the Padre departed, Lumian took a different path and made it back home unscathed. Auror, clad in a pristine apron, bustled about the oven. What are you up to? Lumian inquired with curiosity. It was still two hours till lunchtime. Auror tucked a strand of her blonde locks behind her ear and beamed, trying out a new toast recipe. Rice bread. You don't have to go through all this trouble. Lumian was moved to his core. He believed Auror was going out of her way to make something special just for him. Auror giggled and retorted, What are you thinking? Can you be any more self-absorbed? For me, baking is a form of amusement. It's a great way to pass the time. You get it. Then why don't you like going out? There's plenty of fun out there, Lumian probed. He always felt Aurora was a homebody because she was too concerned about the risks her warlock status posed. Aurora swiveled her head and shot him a withering glare. You mean drinking and gambling? 
Remember, I'm my own person, not relying on or attaching to others. Lumine grasped the first half of her statement but was at a loss with the latter. Ah, uh, could you expound on that? Oror gave him a deadly glare. Long story short, your sis is a major introvert most of the time. What do you mean by most of the time? Lumian queried, confused. Humans are walking contradictions, or amused, turning back to the oven. Don't you recall? Sometimes, I'm a chatterbox, eager to venture out and listen to the old lady's gossip. Other times, I'll play with the kids and regale them with tales. Every so often, I'll cut loose and ride Madame Puali's horse around the mountains, hollering at the top of my lungs. At the time, you shone like a dukis rose, luring people in only to prick them. Lumian couldn't help but grumble to himself. Since Madame Puali's was mentioned, Lumian decided to change the subject. The Oror, a grand sower, I heard a rumor about Madame Puali's. What is it? Oror did not hide her curiosity. She's a warlock who can talk to the dead. Lumian related to his sister what Ava had divulged. He also brought up the anomaly he'd observed in Guillaume Bennett's comments. Oror halted her work and listened to her brother's account intently. Her mien grew noticeably graver. After Lumian had finished, Oror offered him a smile and assuaged his fears. Don't fret too much. Those three foreigners must be here for something that the Padre and his comrades did in secret. It might have to do with Madame Puali's. Don't mess with Madame Puali's for now. I'll keep an eye on them. Explore the village more, mingle with those foreigners, and try to suss out what's going on. Ha <laughs> ha, compared to that, the lady who gave you the one card is far more intriguing. If things do deteriorate, we must contemplate departing Cordu. We can start making arrangements now. Okay, Lumian nodded in agreement. After a brief silence, he inquired curiously, Oror, if we must depart Cordu, where do you envision moving to? Trier, Oror declared without hesitation. Trier was the capital of the Intis Republic, the apex of culture and art across the continent. Why? Despite considering Trier himself, Lumian posed the question casually. Every Intision coveted a chance to visit Trier. In the eyes of the Triers, there were only two types of individuals in Intis, Triers and Outsiders. Aura responded nonchalantly. A prophet once said, as long as Trier endures, mirth and glee will never. Falter 1. Chapter 13. Attempt. It was the dead of night, and all was quiet. Lumian stirred in his dream once more. The first thing he glimpsed was a faint gray mist. On impulse, he reached into his shirt pocket with his hand. The frigid sensation of cold, hard metal immediately registered in his mind. He retrieved the object he'd felt. A glint of gold illuminated his eyes. It was a gold coin. A louis d'or. It's still here. Lumian sat up and peered down at himself. He still donned the cotton attire, pants, and leather jacket from his last expedition. The nearly two-meter-long steel pitchfork and sharp, iron black axe rested within arm's reach. This was precisely the same condition as when he'd exited the dream. In other words, this dream is persistent. It doesn't reset with each entry. Lumian fiddled with the Louis door and slipped it into his cotton shirt's inner pocket. Though it couldn't be actualized, it was still a joy to have. Lumian rose from bed and gazed out the window for a spell, ensuring the red mountain peak in the ruins hadn't changed. He hoisted his axe and pitchfork, departed his chamber, and entered the dimly lit corridor. Aurora's bedroom and study doors remained ajar. Lumian studied them briefly, then suddenly conceived an idea. In the dream, my room is practically identical to reality. It contains all the expected elements. Aurora's room appears the same at first glance. However, can I locate her witchcraft notebook, secret potion formula, or learn how to become a warlock in her quarters? This notion was akin to a devil's whisper, causing Lumian's heart to race. He was tempted to try. Compared to exploring the unknown, hazardous, enigmatic ruins, sifting through Aurora's room was the simpler, safer option. No, no. Lumian shook his head vigorously and cast the idea aside. He'd rather take his chances than violate Oror's privacy. He wouldn't venture into her bedroom without her approval. This was due to his respect for Oror. If it weren't for Oror, he would have perished as a child on the streets five years ago. Lumian withdrew his pain gaze and made his way to the stairs. If the occupant of the room wasn't Oror, he would have already delved into search for useful information. Once downstairs, Lumian didn't hasten his departure. Instead, he inspected the provisions in the kitchen. The olive oil, corn oil, and animal fat that Aurora had amassed were neatly arranged in buckets and cans, just like in reality. Almost instinctively, Lumian lifted the bucket of corn oil and positioned it near the stove. His sole reason for selecting it was that animal fat and olive oil were pricier. 
Then he adeptly kindled a blaze in the hearth with coal and wood, and fashioned a couple of torches to ignite. He was preparing to incinerate that monster. Naturally, it would be preferable if there were other options. That was a last resort. After completing these tasks, he retrieved his axe, opened the door, and departed. Lumion then observed something unusual. The faint gray mist that suffused the dream felt more humid than before. The ground beneath his feet was also slightly muddy. It rained. This place persists and develops naturally according to certain laws when I'm absent or dreaming. Lumion was somewhat taken aback, but he had an inkling that it was only fitting. Recalling Aurora's bizarre tales, he suddenly had a notion. This can't be the real world, can it? My dream is connected to the genuine world. That tarot card enables me to traverse the barrier between dream and the ruins while conscious. Lumion swiftly surveyed his surroundings and realized that an endless gray fog bordered both sides of the ruins on the dream's periphery. I'll check later. I won't venture into the ruins. I'll stroll out of the gray fog and see if it's a surreal and irrational dream after passing through the gray fog, or if there's tangible land, sky, village, and town. If it were the former, it signified that this place was still a dream. If it wasn't, Lumion had to confirm which world this was. He surmised that based on the usage of the Louis door, this place still appeared to be in the Antis Republic, but it might not be the present era. It could be a location that had vanished decades or centuries ago. However, Lumion sensed that there was a high likelihood that he wouldn't be able to exit the encompassing gray fog. He gathered his thoughts and proceeded toward the ruins. He didn't forget that the purpose of entering the dream was to attempt to contend with that monster. After traversing a hundred to two hundred meters in the muddy wilderness riddled with gravel and crevices, Lumion abruptly halted. He thought of a problem. He'd overlooked something in his preparations earlier. Previously, his two-story abode lacked any flames. It was quite secure in this world cloaked in gray fog. But now, it had a blazing furnace that emitted light. Would it draw in a swarm of monsters and render the safe zone unsafe? Lumion instinctively turned his head and peered in the direction he'd come from. He observed that a scarlet gleam had been etched on various glass windows at the base of the half-submerged two-story structure in the faint gray mist. It was akin to a beacon in the dark world. Considering that a considerable amount of time had elapsed, it was evidently too late to attempt to extinguish the fire. Lumion hastened his pace and entered the ruins, taking refuge in the building that had crumbled due to a conflagration. He clipped the axe to the back of his belt and agilely scaled a wall, concealing himself in a shadowy nook separated by bricks and timber. Lumion gazed at his home on the other side of the wilderness. As time ticked by, he didn't witness any monsters lured by the fire. Seems like the fire won't trigger any changes. At the very least, my house won't be besieged by monsters. Lumion breathed a sigh of relief. This meant that even if he encountered any peril, as long as he could flee home promptly and slumber as soon as possible, he could successfully elude it. He began to contemplate how to entice and eliminate the previous monster. From their brief skirmish, he'd deduced that its strength, speed, reaction time, and agility were similar to his, but he could sense that it fought on instinct. It lacked sufficient experience, expertise, or corresponding intelligence. That's why he'd been able to counter and slay it when it ambushed him. It'll also be bewildered and taken aback. It's not dissimilar to humans. Other than combat techniques, I have two other advantages over it. Firstly, I possess superior intelligence. Secondly, I know how to wield weapons and utilize tools. This is the greatest advantage humans possess over such monsters. As long as I'm cautious, defeating it again won't be arduous. The most crucial aspect is how to eradicate it completely. Just as Lumion was about to deliberately stir up some commotion to see if he could lure over some monster, he spied a figure stealthily approaching the utterly ruined house on the side. The figure was crimson and devoid of skin. Its muscles, blood vessels, and fascia were exposed. It was the monster from last time. Unlike before, this monster was wielding a manure fork. A manure fork. It knows how to wield weapons too. Lumion's countenance stiffened as his expression turned grim. Unwittingly, his confidence waned a bit. As the monster drew closer and turned, Lumion perceived exaggerated wounds on its back, neck, and the nape of its neck. However, the fissures were no longer oozing pus, and it appeared to have mostly mended. It's indeed the one I encountered previously. Its self-healing ability is many times superior to that of ordinary humans. Lumion gasped soundlessly. He compelled himself to compose and expeditiously assess the situation. In the twinkling of an eye, Lumion arrived at a determination. This was a prime opportunity, and he had to seize it when he encountered it. He couldn't let it slip by. He silently retrieved a stone brick beside him and awaited the monster's arrival at the desired location. In just a few strides, the monster entered Lumion's kill zone. 
Lumion abruptly hurled the stone brick at the ground behind the monster. Thud, the stone brick clattered, causing the monster to swivel around and scrutinize the assailant. Upon beholding this, Lumion seized the axe with both hands and pounced fiercely from the wall towards the monster. Bang! The axe descended heavily onto the monster's neck, cleaving it in two. With twin thuds, Lumion and the monster plummeted to the ground simultaneously. Lumion sprang up nimbly, seized his axe, and darted over, delivering weighty slashes to the monster's neck. Once, twice, thrice. The monster didn't even get a chance to resist before its head was lopped off. As the head rolled aside, the skinless body convulsed twice and ceased movement. Lumion didn't halt there. He took a diagonal step, rotated his axe, and pulverized the vicious head with its thick back, reducing it to fragments. Subsequently, he pivoted and hacked at the exposed muscles, blood vessels, and fascia, crushing the heart and other vital organs. After accomplishing all of this, Lumion took two paces backward and surveyed his handiwork. He panted and chuckled softly. I thought you were truly invincible. Who'd have thought you possessed so little ability? Amidst the subdued laughter, the decapitated cadaver abruptly jolted upward. Lumion's pupils contracted, and he instinctively wished to pivot and flee. He forcefully quelled this impulse and strode forward once more, brandishing his axe. After the corpse bounced twice, it reverted to immobility, as if it had writhed in vain. Lumion scrutinized it a while longer and ultimately verified that the monster was wholly deceased. How tenacious! Lumion sighed inwardly. Then, he leaned over and crouched down. He employed his axe to pry open the muscles and fascias and scrutinize the corpse. The monster's bodily structure wasn't dissimilar to a human's, but its muscles were evidently more animated. Even though it was already dead, some of its incisions were still wriggling slightly. There's no treasure, nor is there any supernatural power transferred into my body. Lumion assessed his present state and felt somewhat disenchanted. The adage that one grows stronger with each monster they slay indeed only existed in Aurora's tales. He then relocated the monster's corpse and head into the ruined building and entombed them with bricks and timber. Subsequently, he scoured the burnt-down house, hoping to discover something. Chapter 14 Different Monster After a bout of searching, Lumion stumbled upon a considerable number of gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins. In total, there were 197 Verl d'or and 25 Coppet. Among them, Louis d'or alone constituted five. As for the paper bills, he only discovered some suspected remnants. Aside from money, Lumion also discovered a small blue book. The book had a grayish-blue cover and measured approximately 21 by 28.5 centimeters, a typical size found in Antis villages and towns. It was based on the calendar and blended with the religious teachings of the two major churches. It had a rather positive effect on guiding farmers and herders to farm, produce, and graze to enrich their spiritual lives. Naturally, even though it had been nearly two centuries since Emperor Roselle advocated compulsory education, there were still a large number of farmers, herdsmen, and workers who knew no more than a handful of words and were illiterate. They could only rely on the explanations of certain people around them to obtain the instructions they needed from the Blue Book, literally known as Liver Blue. Lumion flipped through a few pages nonchalantly and realized that the Liver Blue was no different from his own. It was just that it appeared a little older overall. There's the Liver Blue and so much Verldor. This family is undoubtedly well-to-do in the countryside. There aren't more than five such families in Cordu. Lumion discarded the liver blue and placed the gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins into different pockets. Some were stashed deep in the cotton shirt's pocket, some were tucked into his pants pocket, and some were haphazardly stuffed into the pocket of his leather jacket. Even though Lumion knew that this wealth couldn't be brought to reality, he couldn't resist collecting it for safekeeping. These little trinkets of gold, silver, or copper were simply irresistible. During his days as a vagrant, he cherished every coin he came across, even if it was just a coppet or a lick. He often fought with others for them and took risks to obtain them. After scouting the area, Lumion hoisted his axe and crept towards the collapsed building closer to the reddish-brown mountain peak. He proceeded deeper and deeper. Every time he traversed the empty space in the center of the ring, he was apprehensive that dozens of monsters would suddenly ambush him in an area without cover. In the faint gray fog, Lumion crouched down and sneaked behind a half-collapsed stone wall. He squatted there and utilized it to conceal his form. He cautiously poked his head out and surveyed the area ahead. It was a narrow strip between two rows of destroyed buildings. There were no trees, no weeds, just gravel, crevices, and dirt. Suddenly, a figure jumped into Lumion's line of sight. It stood in the opposing building, staring at something. 
This figure was garbed in a black robe with a hood. From the back, there was nothing peculiar. It appeared to be an ordinary human. Lumian's heart constricted as he became even more watchful. In such a dream ruin, the appearance of a regular person was far more terrifying than the appearance of a monster. As if sensing that someone was observing him, the figure swiveled around slowly. Lumian snuck a quick glance before retracting his head hastily. He leaned against the wall and didn't dare to budge. With just one look, he had the impression that he had descended into hell or an abyss. The figure was indeed a human, but he had three faces and six eyes. The face in front had cloudy eyes, sparse eyebrows, and numerous wrinkles. He was evidently an old man. The left side was a chiseled face with sharp-looking blue eyes and a thick, black beard, making him appear like a burly man. The skin on the right side was smooth and delicate, like a peeled egg. The blue eyes exuded obvious innocence and ignorance. It didn't seem a day over five years of age. What kind of monster is this? Lumian attempted to regulate his breathing to prevent his heart from racing. Such a monster had never surfaced, even in Aurora's horror tales. Only in the deepest and most absurd nightmares could it be encountered. Although it was not good to judge a person by their appearance, Lumian instinctively sensed that the three-faced monster was far more powerful than the skinless monster from earlier. Furthermore, there was a high probability that it had exceptional abilities. Eternal Blazing Sun Great Father, please protect me from being discovered by it. Upon witnessing this scene, Lumian couldn't help but pray to the Eternal Blazing Sun. If he weren't still clutching an axe in one hand and was in a perilous environment, he would have extended his arms, a gesture symbolizing the adoration of the sun. At that moment, time appeared to stand still. Lumian believed he might be hallucinating. It was as if someone's stare pierced through the wall and landed on his back. His back stiffened instantly and felt somewhat warm. In just a second or two, the illusion vanished, and heavy footsteps receded into the distance. Lumian waited a while until the footsteps dissipated completely. Then, he gradually straightened his knees, turned around, and poked his head out to survey the area ahead. The monster was farther away, having arrived behind the collapsed building whose two sides still stood. Half of its body was visible in the faint gray mist. It still had his back to Lumian, as though it had transformed into a statue. Lumian breathed a sigh of relief. He didn't have the confidence to confront such a monster. It's definitely impossible to venture deeper into the ruins from here. Should I circumvent it? Won't there be comparable monsters elsewhere? The closer I approach that mountain peak, the more potent the monsters that emerge. Lumian retracted his body and deliberated for a while before deciding to conclude the night. He intended to inquire with the woman who gave him the tarot card after Daybreak to see if there was a means of dealing with the three-faced monster. If there was no alternative, he would consider taking a detour. He arched his back, detached from the wall, and headed in the direction he came from. At that moment, he had a notion. If I slumber in these ruins, will I be able to escape the dream? Considering the possibility of numerous monsters in the vicinity, he suppressed the urge to experiment, for now. On the way back, he hastily searched every destroyed building he passed, but he couldn't unearth any useful written information. There were only a few coins. After retreating for a while, Lumian conceived a notion and decided to take a detour. He approached the burnt-out house that he encountered first from the side, where he had buried the skinless monster. He wanted to see if the monster's demise would be detected by its kin and if it would result in any changes. After locating the spot and concealing himself, Lumian poked his head out from the side and scrutinized the target area. In the following moment, he caught sight of another figure. The figure was half-human and half-beast. Its legs were bent forward as it squatted there and inspected the skinless monster's cadaver. It had already removed the stone bricks and wooden blocks that Lumian had stacked. It wore a dark jacket and relatively snug muddy pants. Its black hair that hung to its neck was unkempt and greasy, and it carried a shotgun on its back. A shotgun? Lumian averted his gaze hastily and withdrew his head. These monsters are truly absurd. They actually know how to wield a shotgun. At that moment, Lumian felt like he was a hunter, hunting in the mountains with his weapon and comrades, only to discover that the rabbit opposite him was clutching a water-cooled machine gun and targeting them. He considered it ridiculous and immersion-breaking, as well as disappointing. As time elapsed, he waited patiently for the monster with the shotgun to depart. Finally, he discerned a faint sound of movement, gradually receding. Lumian stuck his head out cautiously once again and examined the monster that was half-human and half-beast. It moved like a cat towards the back of the building. Initially, Lumian's heart eased, but then his eyes widened. He realized that the path the monster took was precisely the same as the route he took when he ventured deep into the ruins. It's tracking me. It has an extraordinary tracking ability. Lumian made a subconscious evaluation. 
he was exceedingly grateful that he had opted for a detour when he returned. Otherwise, he would have certainly collided with it and might have even been ambushed. As soon as the monster vanished, Lumion sprang up and dashed towards his house. The crimson fire that reflected in the glass window on the ground floor of the house was akin to sunlight that could dispel darkness. Lumion sprinted all the way to his two-story building, yanked open the unlatched door, and rushed inside. After locking the door, he gazed at the ruins through the window. Far from the gray mist, at the edge of the ruins, there stood a faint figure, but it didn't approach. Phew, Lumion exhaled and planned to extinguish the fire, ascend upstairs to slumber, and exit the dream. He glanced at the still-burning fire and murmured to himself, It can still burn for a while. I can experiment and see if it continues to burn until it extinguishes after I depart the dream, or if it is frozen in time the moment I leave. Lumion had previously verified through the rain that the wilderness where the ruins were located was undergoing natural development. It had nothing to do with whether he was dreaming or not, but whether the same situation was transpiring in his house or the so-called safe zone remained to be verified. He acted on his notion. He added a few more coals to the fire and fiddled with them. Then, he carried the axe and steel fork to the second floor and entered the bedroom. When Lumion arose, it was just after daybreak. He inspected his shirt-like pajamas. As anticipated, he was disheartened to discover that the gold coins, silver coins, and copper coins did not accompany him into reality. Lumion exited the bed and stretched his body. He sauntered to the desk and extended his hand to draw the curtains. Amidst the sound, a mild and refreshing radiance trickled in. As the window opened, fresh and organic air invaded Lumion's nostrils. He couldn't help but extend himself, feeling that waking up early was quite pleasant at times. Of course, this was also owing to the patriotic public health campaign that Emperor Roselle had launched. It was also thanks to the subsequent rulers who had preserved it and only altered its name. He surveyed his surroundings, sometimes gazing at the far-off forest, sometimes scrutinizing the orange-red clouds in the sky and sometimes observing the weeds outside the house. Suddenly, Lumion's stare froze. He spied a larger bird perched on an elm tree not far away. It had a pointed beak, a feline face, brown feathers with scattered spots, brownish-yellow eyes combined with black pupils, giving it a sharp appearance. It was an owl. It appeared to be observing Lumion. Chapter 15, Getting Information That owl, that owl from the warlock legend, is mind raced with possibilities, trying to comprehend the gravity of the situation. His blood seemed to freeze. It was worse than facing the three-faced monster. After all, this was no longer a dream. This was reality. Even if his demise in a dream led to the same in reality, it was different psychologically. What should I do? Will Aura be implicated? As Lumion racked his brain for a countermeasure, the owl remained still, observing him with a piercing gaze. After a few seconds, the owl spread its wings and flew towards the distant forest. Its graceful glide carried it down, down, until it vanished into Cordu. Only when the owl had completely vanished did Lumion's mind snap back to the present. He slumped into a chair and lifted a hand to his forehead. He was drenched in sweat. Is it truly the owl of the warlock legend? Has it truly lived for so many years? In any case, it was unlike any other owl with dull eyes. It almost looked human. If it's really that owl, why did it choose to fly just outside my window? Is it because I want to uncover the truth about the warlock legend? But we've already given up. It left after a few moments of observation. I wonder if it will return and cause trouble for Oror. Despite wanting to observe the situation further since nothing had happened yet, Lumion knew he couldn't keep it from his sister any longer. After leaving the room, he saw that Oror was still asleep. He went downstairs to prepare breakfast, all of which were his sister's favorite dishes. Sunny side up, meringue cookies, ordinary toast with jam. I have to make noodles later. This time, I'll add meat sauce. Lumion mentally noted that the noodle compartment was empty and decided to refill it some time in the next two days. It was Aurora's favorite dish. Aurora descended the staircase in a flowing nightgown, her golden locks tousled. The breakfast spread was readied. Warning, she mumbled, stifling a yawn. Lumion grinned at her. It's not getting early. Don't you always say a day's planning starts early in the morning? That's right. My plan is to sleep. Aurora settled into her seat and tucked into her breakfast with a glass of milk. Lumion sat across from Aurora at the table that could fit six. As he nibbled on a pancake, he casually said, I've been in the village for the past few days trying to find out the truth about those legends. Why? Aurora asked. Lumion was very frank. You didn't want to help me get supernatural powers, so I decided to find my own way. Those legends might contain clues. It's almost impossible, Aurora commented, her tone casual. 
the legends have been twisted beyond recognition over the years, or hallucinated by some loony. It's meaningless. Yes, it's also possible that someone specially made up a story as an excuse. Ha <laughs> ha. And the contributions of rubberneckers like you. What? Lumian didn't understand what Aura meant by rubbernecker. It wasn't even in Tishim. It means people who can't help but get involved in drama they have no business in. Aura explained simply. And judging by how you are suddenly raising this matter, I'm guessing you've caused some trouble and now have no choice but to come home to ask your sister for help. It can be considered an accident, but it's not to the extent of causing trouble, Lumian said, undaunted. Lumian organized his thoughts carefully. My first target was the warlock legend. What warlock legend? Aurora's confusion was palpable. Lumian couldn't believe it. You've never heard of it. A long time ago, a person in the village suddenly died. When he was buried, an owl flew over and stopped by his bed. It only flew away when the corpse was lifted. After that, the corpse became very heavy. It took nine bulls to pull the coffin. Only then did the villagers know that the person was a warlock when he was alive. Aura was listening intently. I really wasn't aware of such a legend before. It doesn't make sense. Lumian was incredulous. Aura may have been a homebody, but she still made time to socialize with the other old ladies in town. She loved telling stories to the children and was always up to date on the latest Kordu gossip. It was hard to believe she hadn't heard about the warlock legend that had been circulating for years. But what was even more intriguing was the fact that her house was built on the very spot where the warlock's home once stood. Lumian had a hunch from the start that Aura's decision to settle in Kordu was driven by the allure of the warlock's treasure, the key to unlocking extraordinary power. And then, Aurora asked calmly. Lumian answered truthfully, We did some digging around, and we got confirmation from the village elders. This wasn't some tall tale. The warlock really did exist, but that was decades ago. The church burned the house down, and now the land belongs to you. Is that so? Aurora was obviously a little surprised. I knew it. There's always a catch. Why else would they sell me this land at a price lower than the norm? I thought it was because of my gift of gab when it came to old ladies. She thought for a moment and asked, So, the church burned the warlock's body. Lumian nodded. Yes, his ashes are buried in the cemetery beside the cathedral. He continued, We've given up on this matter because all the clues led to a dead end. But this morning, I saw an owl outside my window. It looked just like the one in the legend. Aurora's expression became serious. Are you certain? I can't say for sure, but it didn't look like any ordinary owl. Lumian responded objectively. Aurora pondered for a moment before saying slowly, Don't leave the village for now. And after dark, don't step outside until I've finished investigating the situation. She gave a sour smile. I've warned you before about the dangers of seeking supernatural power. But look, trouble has already found you. Fortunately, it seems that the other party doesn't have any malicious intentions. The problem should be resolved relatively easily. I'm glad you're on guard. Lumian lowered his head and said straightforwardly, Grand Sower, I was wrong. He changed the subject. Did your pen pals write back? How can it be that fast? It's not like we're sending e um post. Or a scoffed. Lumian was puzzled. Isn't post already referring to letters and packages sent through the post office? He was not too concerned. After all, Aura often used strange words. At the entrance of all tavern, Lumian stood there and surveyed the area. He knew that the woman who had given him the tarot card wouldn't be awake yet, so he was looking for the three foreigners, Ryan, Lee, and Valentine. As expected, the trio was enjoying a lavish breakfast at a table inside the tavern. Lumian observed them for a few seconds, taking in the spread of trout rolls, wine, and mayonnaise bread, before leaving without disturbing them. Some time later, as Ryan and the others prepared to continue strolling around Kordu and chatting with the locals, Lumian approached them with open arms and a bright smile. Good morning, my cabbages. Valentine's face twitched, and between Ryan and Lee, one looked slightly embarrassed while the other looked amused. Oh, they're dressed exactly the same. Did they not bring many changes of clothes despite being out? Lumian noticed that Lee was still clad in a snug pleated cashmere dress, a small white coat, and a pair of Marsalan boots, each adorned with a small silver bell. Her veil which doubled as a hat also had bells attached to it. Ryan was still sporting a drab duffel coat and pale yellow strides, topped with a rough dark bowler hat. And Valentine still had powdered hair and makeup on his face. Good morning, Lumian. What brings you here? Ryan asked calmly. Lumian looked aggrieved as he responded. Well, you guys are my friends, and I have nothing to do. I thought I'd come visit. He then questioned them. I noticed that you've been chatting with people in the village for the past few days. Is there anything you want to ask? You can come to me if you have any questions, my cabbages. I'm your friend. We can't trust your answer, Valentine interjected. Ryan shot him a look, signaling him to calm down. Lumian smiled. 
so you can completely trust the others. Lee was at a loss for words, while Ryan thought for a moment before responding. Actually, we can't completely trust anyone. We have to make a comprehensive judgment based on the answers we get from different people and the situation we observe. That's more like it. Lumian spread his hands. Well, then it wouldn't hurt to hear my answer. At least it's a reference. Ryan was silent for a moment before glancing around. The early morning in Cordu was bustling with people heading to the farmlands, but there was hardly anyone near all tavern. Here's the deal, he said finally. We're here to find someone. The Padre, Lumian asked with a smile. Ryan shook his head. No, we visited the Padre to find this person. Who is it? Lumian asked with interest. I know everyone in the village. I should be able to help. Ryan did not show any joy. Actually, we don't know who this person is, how old they are, or what they look like. We received an unsigned letter some time ago, and we're trying to find the person who wrote it. Lumian couldn't help but wonder if the letter was from an informer. He feigned puzzlement. Did the person who wrote the letter not reach out to you after you arrived in the village? No, Lee replied for Ryan. Perhaps they don't feel safe and don't trust you, Lumian suggested eagerly. Can't you glean any clues from the contents of the letter? Lumian was curious about the letter's contents. If it was targeting the Padre's crew, he'd be happy to help them. But if it involved Auror, he'd urge his sister to move. After all, Auror communicated with her pen pals frequently, and if any of them were caught, she could be implicated. The letter could be a crucial clue. 